Okay, welcome everybody to Product Tank's uh, Product Tank Cork's first event in a while. I'm afraid we've uh, had a bit of a. Sorry, I've got feedback. Okay, best laid plans. So, um, welcome to Product, Product Tanks Corks uh, reemergence after COVID. Um, we're very excited to have our first virtual event actually going on now tonight. So, um, before we get started, I just want to introduce everybody to you're watching on YouTube, obviously, and um, <clears throat> just want to show you how you can engage with us during the live event. Uh, Shortly we'll kick off, and down here on the on the right is where we're going to, you know, this is where you give us your chat, your your questions, and uh, hopefully we can uh, feed them to David after the after his presentation. Um, you may need to create a channel to join the chat if you're logged into Google, for example, in this uh, in, into Chrome in this uh, scenario, and uh, then you'll be able to type your messages here and send. So, uh, without further ado. I will hand off to Fanola. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to uh, Product Tank Cork. We're delighted to be um, back sharing our product uh, ideas and product perspectives and, and knowledge with everybody here in the group. Um, so just a, a little reminder about Product Tank itself and what it is. Um, Product Tank is, um, I don't know if there's a next slide there. Tunnel? Yep. Yeah. Um, product Tank is the world's largest product community. It's a uh, by product people for product people. Um, product Tank itself is in over 200 cities worldwide. Um, so it's, it, is, um, it is very large. And also um, it is part of the Mind the Product group as well. Um, and Mind the Product is the global professional network for product people. Um, so for today's talk, um, we are delighted to introduce you to David O'Brien from Dell, who's our speaker today on the topic of bot wor workforces. And this is an area where David is hugely knowledgeable and has fascinating insights that he's going to share with us today. So very welcome, David, and over to you. Oh, thanks, Donald. Thanks, Finola. Um, delighted to be here and uh, to share some what I hope you guys find very interesting today on something that I'm very, very passionate about and something that is having a very, very large impact on the way we work, industry in general, and you know we're only just at the beginning of it. So I'm just gonna share my screen here and bring you through a short presentation, um, highlighting what um, I've been doing uh, in Dell in my current role, which I'll explain to you in a, in, in a minute talk about the industry at large, and then talk about how actually looking at this from a product viewpoint has really helped us go to the next level while looking at our bot workforce. So um, there's be a, hopefully a few nuggets for all of you today in the information that I'm sharing. So by introduction, and I know I'll give it a nice intro there, um, I'm actually just recently uh, promoted to the director of the Automation Center of Excellence and Automation Experience team. So. Uh, as uh, a proud Corkman, I'm lucky enough to lead a global team um, based across Brazil, the US, Malaysia, India, and uh, building our, our presence in, in Europe actually uh, at the moment, who focus in on automation technologies. Um, the, I've been in Dell for about, well, I joined EMC, Dell bought EMC uh, in my 10th year now. And uh, I got into the automation game probably about five years ago at this stage and robotic process automation, which was a new concept at the time had just started. And as someone who worked in IT for the previous few years, particularly supporting HR systems and you know, big, large multinational, I saw a way of doing work a lot quicker than what I was able to do before. All right, and that's how I got into automation. So. Well, that's enough about me, though. Let, let's let's talk about um, about our bot workforce and what this actually means. So, um, just moving here. Yep. 
So look, automation in general, right? So this is from last year, 10th of March, 2020, uh, just before everything closed down. And you'll notice from that picture that my hair has grown a lot since then with, uh, with the hairdressers being closed. So I'm looking forward to, to getting my hair cut. But um, this statement that you know Gartner did when they were giving an, an industry view is, you know, expect every, that everything that can and should be automated will be automated rightly or wrongly. Okay, that's your choice. And five or six years ago, when I started into this journey, there was a lot of fear around automation. So talking about robotic process automation, you're hearing about robots. And people are like, well, okay, you know, the Terminator's coming, Cyberdyne are going to be taking over. That's the end of jobs, life, everything. You know, that was actually the lens a lot of people were looking through. But we've seen a real, real change over the last few years where people are realizing that the bot workforce and that's what automation is. That's what bots are. You know, they're not intelligent beings who can, you know, see into the future or, you know, they can analyze huge data sets, don't get me wrong, and make predictions. But, you know, they aren't uh, a like-for-like -like replication of human beings, okay? And what we've seen is we've got to treat automation and our bot workforce as something to make us more productive and something that, you know, this is very markety, but takes a robot out of our own work. And... And we've seen, and I'll show you now some of the success that we've had in actually internally in Dell. And I've been primarily focused internally in, in Dell and in transforming the way we, we do our own work. Um, there's been a lot of a lot of personal benefits from that. We haven't resulted to you know thousands of people being made redundant because of automation, which is rightly the fear sometimes uh, in certain areas. It's really been about, wow, okay, I'm able to do my job faster. I'm focusing on what I've actually been trained to do. So if I'm an accountant, for example, I'm not spending 90% of my week pulling the reports and pulling the data together. I'm actually spending 90% of the week looking at the data, coming up with the insights and making predictions based off that. So, you know, that's, that's, that's the kind of thing that we've seen. But rightly or wrongly, automation is here. So I even five years ago, when I was looking at that train, I was thinking, right, do I get on it or do I not? And it's much better to be part of this um, because, as you'll find, and it's it's really about demystifying what automation is, it's 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 just a new way of approaching problems, okay? It's like another, another way of looking at all the process engineering that we've done over the last few years, all of the challenges that we have in everyday work. You know, there's actually some very simple solutions there through technology, and it's not that complicated. Hyper-automation, what's hyper-automation? It's an awful term coined in the industry. What it really means, hyper-automation, is you're connecting a lot of automation strands, RPA. Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll talk about the technologies now in this, in this slide. So in my own team, okay, and, and what we do, um, my, own, my own team, and, like, you know, I'm, I'm in charge of it, but the guys that do all of the work, I, some very, very intelligent people who focus on enabling um, different business areas. It's a huge company, 140,000 people in, in Dell, um, to actually set up their own automation teams and really automate what's important to them. So, you know, you're talking to folks in HR, you're talking to folks in global operations, which is manufacturing, procurement, we've got our services organization, finance, etc. cetera. Um, they all have different needs and wants, okay? And traditionally, uh, any automation would have been done through the IT department. So, you know, hey, we're going to come up with a huge ERP system, automate these flows. It's going to take three years. It's going to cost $100 million. Um, that was your, your typical road to success uh, from an automation point of view. So very daunting. And, you know, you, you weren't touching that unless you were really sure of some success. So what, what our team does is go, right, let's demystify this, let's make it easier to understand, let's make it easier to consume and bring in tools like robotic process automation, like chatbots, like orchestration technologies, and let our business units actually use these, okay? But in a safe, governed way, okay? Because I am still in IT. Now, you saw Dell Digital at the start, that's our fancy name for IT here, here in Dell. And as a center of excellence, I sit in the center of that spoke, all right? So we have about 50 different business units that have their own automations teams, and we set the governance of standards. We work with security, which is hugely important these days. And we set the, those best standards, and we use these technologies that you see on screen here. So on the left-hand side, you see process automation. That's the standard stuff, but that's still, you hear the term low-hanging fruit. There is so much out there. doesn't matter what company you're in, okay? 
there is so much that we do that's repeatable but easy to automate, okay? And we tend to use RPA. And RPA is user interface-based automation, so essentially screen scraping, all right? And it, it actually derived from test script automation software at the time. Um, but we, what we did is we put a server architecture around it, made it centrally governed, okay? And what you're doing is you're, this is how, these are our bots, okay? The bot, you could create bots who ran scripts, all right? So we had this concept of virtual employees here in Dell. They had their own credentials in our HR systems. You could hire them onto your staff, and then you're assigning them work to do, okay? By creating these RPA scripts. And they focus heavily on that left-hand side bucket, you know, data entry, scraping. And in a company as large as us, there was a huge opportunity there to, to do it. And I'll, I'll show you an example of, of, uh, of an area that we, we focus in on just using RPA. Um, but that RPA, the orchestration, that, when I say easy, what I mean, it's, it's easier in relation in, relative to other things, okay? But what you can do is really focus on rules-based work, all right? and really change the way your operations. How do I use my virtual workforce to augment me, okay? I've only got a limited budget. I can't hire 50 more people to do this. Um, we either let everybody decide or do we look at automation? And that's what we've done with the RPA side. But as we go up the curve, we go into intelligence, cognitive computing, all right? And that's where we're starting to focus uh, today, the unstructured data, all right? When you think about robots and intelligence and AI, okay? That's where we start playing in that space. and. What we're doing now is we're trying to make that easier to consume, okay? Because we've done a pretty good job on the process automation side, but now how do we, you know, these are all hot button technologies, but some of them are like the machine learning models, right? Chatbots are, are basically just models that have been trained, right? They're not necessarily super intelligent, gonna change the world type things on their own. So how do we actually start to teach people how to use these? And, and that's that's what we've been focusing to do. But, one thing I just want to highlight on this is that our virtual workforce, it's cheap, okay? And we've lots of it. And I'll show that on the next slide. But at the start, five years ago, I keep referring to five years ago, what was the focus? Cost. How do I drive cost down? How do I, how do, how do I save time here? Do you know, that, that was our focus. But as we've gone up the curve and as time has passed, it really has become right business value, okay? I want to go in and tackle this problem. Stakeholders have this issue. How do we use automation to fix those issues? And that's that's the way it's changed. And that's why it's becoming more and more part of everyday conversation. If you're not becoming tech savvy in the in the current world, or when I say tech savvy, you don't have to be technical, but understanding that, hey, this is part of your toolkit and you should be using it. That this virtual workforce is coming into every single company. All right. And Dell is probably just a bit further ahead than most on, on that front. Okay. So from a footbit point of view. Now, I can't share the official numbers, but let's just say it's three digits million, okay? And um, in the last five years, we've gone from having, you know, five people working on this when I first joined the team to a team of 70 uh, are focused on just automating a lot of this work, right? And it's all about looking at, right, how do we make our folks more productive, but where are the opportunities, okay? We can now audit things at 100% that we wouldn't have been able to do, for example. We're able to um, go into tax now and pull all of the receipts and do a consolidation that would have taken six months and you know even have it run for one month if you wanted. It doesn't necessarily have to be the most efficient. You know, There's different ways that we approach this, but I'll, I'll talk about maybe the approach a little bit when I'm, I'm on about the product piece. But like on the RPA footprint alone, we have 800 plus processes. Um, the, that's 800 processes spread across all of these teams that you see in front of you. And they're working across all of these applications. So these virtual employees, and I do encourage you guys to go in and have a look at something like UiPath or Automation Anywhere, watch a video of how these, these technologies work. Because it's very, very simple. Like where before, where it's like, right, we need to automate in this area. Let me teach you about it. You have to engage with the business analyst. It, it can be quite daunting. We need to build a, a big, business requirements document and you know a, a very technical software engineer is going to develop this for you, people can be turned off by that approach. With these technologies, particularly with UI, right? We see it as a very much uh, a good way of embedding um, automation into areas that might be resistant. Because like Dell technology company, there's a hell of a lot of people in Dell that aren't actually technical. Okay. And so for us, we always had to focus on right, how do we make it easier to consume? And that's how we started moving to a product-based model because we had to start thinking of it in that way, all right? So that's just uh, a show of some of the footprint. 
this is one example of our virtual bots and the type of impact they can have, right? So um, this is quite old data, but it just highlights a very good point, right? So um, some of you would have heard, and this might be in your product, you know, when you're from a discovery point of view, it, where are the opportunities for me to, to, to make improvements? Well, in our maintenance renewals area, uh, there was they were firefighting every quarter. Okay, so they had thousands of these maintenance renewals cuts where you know customers are paying maintenance on, say, some of the, the servers that we sell to them. Okay, as an example, and uh, what was happening is you know everything that was above 50k in value. Where do you think the sales team were spending most of their time in that bucket? Nice, nice reward there. Less of them, bigger payout. Okay, but then you have this extremely long tail of these um, these maintenance renewal contracts that we're not getting to. Okay, so anything sub 50k in value. All right, and you know the 10 to 50k's they were being tackled, but anything less than 10k in value, like the salespeople didn't want to know, and it was a huge amount of work to, went to create just one of these quotes. So what before we got okay, let's let's create two new applications and spend you know a year trying to create this. We stood up an RPA in four weeks, and that's the speed of this stuff. That um, actually went ahead, logged into the relevant applications, uh, interacted with uh, people in the workflow, and what what happened? Sorry, what was a firefight every week of the quarter with a backlog? And what was happening was customers were going, "Hey, my maintenance expired in February, and you've given me a quote in September. I'm not paying you for the last nine months, you know, or six months, whatever it is." There's no payoff there. You know that's that that was really costing the group a hell of a lot of money. All right, and so with this, we were able to stand something up, and it became an RPA that ran for about six hours, I believe, every month. Processed all of the quotes that were coming up, logged into all those applications, and then anything from 50k between 10 and 50k that was reviewed by the sales team. So that 90% volume that's see there, but anything greater. Than 10k, I mean less than 10k, I should say. That went directly to the customer with no fingers touching it at all. All right, and this is this is all day. So that got to the stage where you know everything in the 50k range and down was not being reviewed because the trust was built on the automation technology. So what became a huge issue, costing loads of money. There were like literally hundreds of people trying to work on this. There's one RPA bot costs us less than 10 grand to own. Um, and it's only doing one task once a month, so it's free for the whole rest of the month. You know, these these things are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We were able to uh, we were able to to just completely transform that process very very quickly, and that was the first pass in four weeks. And that's the beauty of this stuff, and this is how it starts relating into into products. Uh, this because we stood something up, and it's been continuously refined and improved over those time. Some of it's actually been taken back into the core core systems we've got the flexibility to actually handle that okay so traditionally what have we been doing all right so square you know the the square peg round hole well that's that you know up in our last five years that was really starting to to impact us right so what was happening is you know we might be using a tool like automation anywhere and we need to use automation anywhere for everything Okay, so this is where we're getting the success. It's working really well. We should be using this, right? And also we were stuck in a very old waterfall model, right? Get the analysis, requirements, design, development, do testing for ages, and then eventually come up with something that you want. Okay, I don't think that story is going to be new to anybody on this call. Um, so, but it, like it was actually a lot faster than what we were doing with our traditional IT apps in that space, but you know, still, we're having issues where, you know, huge amount of bureaucracy, documentation, um, and just, you know, time to like, so, like you can build an RPA in a week, right? But with all of the, you know, the governance and security standards and making sure the code has been reviewed and all of that, what we're finding is that he was taking approximately three months to get a lot of these RPAs in. And, and I, I'm focusing on RPA because it's, it's the easiest one to talk about. We had similar issues in some of the other areas, right? But everything was about the tool. So, okay, we should use, you know, System Center Orchestrator here. We should UI, use UiPath here. Um, it was just tool focused, okay? So you were never looking at what was needed. You were like, yeah, we own these tools. Come to us. We'll help you. We'll train you, and then you can use them. And we were coming across limitations last year with this, and we knew we needed to change. And so what we were thinking of doing is, all right, we'll change to Agile. Okay, that would have been the, the obvious one. 
but uh, actually Dell Digital itself, the IT organization that I'm talking about, actually was really pushing for the whole organization to start adopting product. And I, I'll say this myself, I was late to the game on this. So I was like, okay, it's, it's just another form of agile as far as I could see. But after getting involved with it and understanding it and really focusing um, what we're doing around our personas and, and, and who's actually consuming our automation technologies, it's really created a mind shift in, um, in how we're approaching this. So where before it was like, yeah, use this tool, deal with these people, that they're the tool teams. We're like, how do we change it? So I'll show you what we, we changed it from. Uh, sorry, we changed it too. But uh, why, why, did, why is product great, right? So like I said, these automation technologies, you know, the five or six that we're actually using, they allow for real, real rapid prototyping, okay? And that's the key thing with this. We're pulling ourselves out of the IT budget roadmap model that you'd see in a lot of companies. It's not like, right, I have a great idea, let's get it funded, we'll go through that huge process, and then next February, next year coming, you can work on it, you can hire folks, you can buy the right the right gear in, okay, to actually do the work. It's really like, right, let's fund some product teams that focus on particular areas for transforming and building our bot workforce, and then, you know, throw things out, okay? And that's, that's what we've been doing, and I, I've really seen a huge growth in our output because of this, okay? Um, faster innovation, we're fixing problems quicker, we're getting less complaints from the business. Think speed, speed, speed is always my favorite one, but just the quality of everything we're doing is has improved because we're embedding everything in the process. You know, even security, where security was like, we need to have a review here and a review there. This might stop it. We're gonna have to get somebody from the security organization to review it, that's gonna take three weeks. It's like, right, We've now training all of our developers in the the software development life cycle. They get they get a green belt and a yellow belt or whatever one it, they need to, depending on the level is. And then we're just embedding security into that. So it's like, how do we pull everything to the sprints, but then make sure that our product managers are actually working on what's actually important, okay? And that's where that funding strategically and all allocating tech comes from, right? So it's actually just coming this year where I know when I'm looking at my budgets for, for the quarter, know that I have a particular product capacity and that's how I'm managing it. But if I want to move from one product to another product, I have the freedom to do that, okay? And move move my money around. Where before it was, right, we have X, Y, Z projects, okay? Um, I said Z there, you can tell I work at an American company. But uh, we have all these projects, you're doing it the year, you got to make sure you're, you're charging hours against it and come hell or high water, you better deliver it, okay? And that's just transformed it. Like our engineers now have just so much more freedom to, to make their own decisions as they go through, really Im impact the way we're actually delivering some of our, our virtual workers, okay? And then the stakeholder focus, you know, that user centricity, that's the really key thing. And that's what's made us come up with the digital worker concept I'll talk about in a second, okay? So with, that's the reason we've adopted product. So we've ended up creating these two product lines, okay? So what I've talked to you primarily about is, automation enablement, our product line, okay? We used to have an AA, an automation anywhere team, a walk me team, a UiPath team. What, what we've really done is we've combined all that together, put someone in charge of RPA, of our real-time capabilities, which is our, you know, our API development, you know, instantaneous data pulls, you name it, orchestration. We've got chatbots, a dedicated team that are innovating in the chatbot space. And they're really focusing in on those areas and looking at it from their whole picture. Okay, and so what's happening now is when, when, when uh, a demand comes in and going, hey, look, there's an opportunity here for us to look at this. You know, the product managers are looking at this, going, all right, we need a piece from here and a piece from there and a piece from there, and we're going to deliver an end-to-end -end solution. So instead of that square peg round hole, where I'm sure that's the best thing that we could do, now it's becoming, hey, we uh, we're looking at this holistically. Let's use six of these, five of these, two of these, whatever it might be to actually provide an end-to-end -end solution. And that is why on the left, we have the digital worker experience. And this is where the product model really has shown itself up to be you know, just a brilliant approach. Working with our stakeholders in the business, it became clear that, and like I said before, we don't have a lot of technical people in a technology company, You know, when you spread out amongst operations and HR, whatever it might be. Um, we need to appeal to, you know, we have all these technologies, like, like I've talked to you about, automation anywhere and all that for the last, you know, 15, 20 minutes. But really what I need to do is uh, 
create a shopping experience for digital workers. So like what happens today is I want to hire, I go to the hiring portals, I raise a rec, a job rec requisition, create, a, create the job description, post it, get people in, you know, you name it. Why can't we do something similar with the digital worker? Build a digital worker library, marketplace, and focus in on those business units, okay? It's not their fault that they aren't technical, right? So if I'm talking to a HR manager who works in, you know, recruitment support, then um, they should be able to go on to this experience here, have a look at the, um, have a look at what digital workers are available in the HR area and go, oh, okay, this, these, these digital workers work on these systems and those systems, can I hire them? Perfect. Demand comes into our team. We build a digital worker in less time than it would take to hire maybe contingent labor. You know, they're the type of KPIs that we're looking at here. And that mind shift, shift, mind shift in, uh, in the way we're approaching. So we're not talking about the technologies now. We're talking about, right, what digital workers can help fix your problems, okay? That's, um, we're, we're just really excited about the way that this is going. It started out from a ground concept up this time, Matt, well, probably later, we're talking about September. We've already had five or six orders for digital workers, and now we're looking to expand this throughout the whole company. And we're going to be forcing hiring managers down that pathway so that when they're looking at, okay, have you considered digital workers now? It's going to really force us to uh, get digital workers into every area of the business. So that's an example of using the product model there because we had to focus on those personas. But the other persona is the developer themselves, right? Like I'm talking about big numbers here, you know, lots of processes, lots of digital workers. I'm not going to be able to hire a thousand people into my team to build all of this. What we need to do is with the marketplace that you see there, we got to um, uh, provide an environment where developers themselves, the people that create the automations and the various, you know, in IT to all of the areas that I've been talking about, they can post their own digital job descriptions. They can post their own, um, um, you know, top class work that's here and uh, get them posted and get those hired, you know, because if we build that framework and put it out there, then, you know, you're going to build a deeper and richer library. So that's that's what this automation experience is. You know, we have a domain at technology transformation down to the automation experience, and we have these product lines here, and then we have the products that you see. And so, of course, um, uh, supported by the center of excellence that help enable a lot of this as well, okay? So from an industry point of view, what does that mean? So I talked about digital workers, but what you're really going to see, I think, and these are just a couple of trends I'm seeing, is, uh, you know, the AI focus, right? So oh, I've got them mixed around, actually. You, you have more of a focus on the front office, actually, at the moment, you know, like those chatbots you might deal with on the websites. Um, but you're going to see a lot more into the back office now. How do we use AI um, internally to improve our operations, you know, speed up response times? Um, how do we look at all the huge amount of data sets that we're creating internally? You're going to see a lot more of that, okay? So when we talk about digital workers, a lot of the digital workers are going to be doing easy, repeatable stuff, but the the actual AI technologies are really, really improving. The machine learnings are, learning models are getting easier to plug and play with and apply into certain situations. So you're going to see a lot more of that. Uh, I kind of referenced this earlier, but automations, these are, you know, always sitting between systems, you know, swivel chair, you know, I go into Excel, I log into Salesforce, I pull a report from that as well, I pull it all together and upload it to SAP, just making up something random there. But what you're going to see is, well, if you're automate, why are they automating all this? It's because there's gaps in the systems. So what you're doing is you're creating these documented flows and, and automations that can actually be fed back into these core applications. And we're seeing a lot more of that happening because they're realizing that it's a, a demand pipeline for those product teams that run the core apps now. Um, low code, if you're wondering what that is, low code is an approach to um, things like orchestration. Uh, RPA would be considered a version of low code. But what we're seeing is, is we're, there's technologies called low code that uh, basically are business process workflow management that allow you to create, connect a lot of parts together and have business teams manage that. But the, there's always been a, you know, no, you can't have access to my, my application. You know, there's too much sensitive information into that. You'll overload my API. There's a big focus um, to figure out how do we do this in a secure way, govern it properly, because for, the, for, for us to transform, we need to be able to give access to that data in a safe way. Okay, hybrid automation, 
you know, it's all about partnerships. There's a cool new technology called digital assistance, attended assistance. So a lot of what I talked about, it's running on a server. It runs at two o'clock or, you know, you send it an email and it'll kick off or it's waiting for some kind of trigger. But um, some of the technology we're bringing at the moment, we're actually installing bots on people's laptops. So they have a bot, a digital assistant on their laptop that they can access. So they might have, you know, if you're an accountant, for example, there might be 20 bots that have been developed for you to make your job faster during the day that you can access with and you can interact. It's a way of interacting with this virtual workforce that we're talking about. And then process engineering 2.0. So I remember when I started work, there was a massive focus on Lean Six Sigma and, uh, and improving processes. There still is today. Um, but what you're seeing is that those process engineering backgrounds never really even focused on the technology actually are realizing that, you know, with process mining and task mining, we're able to map end to end how data is flowing through companies or, or outside. And, you know, how do we apply automation or, you know, traditional app development to actually fix those. And you're really seeing an uptick in that, you know, mapping of what are we actually doing? The technology is getting better. The AI engines that they use to actually map and bring everything together in a readable format have really improved. Okay, so look, a lot of information there. Uh, if you have any questions for me, don't hesitate to ask. Um, I know that um, um, being a product forum, I'm always interested to grow the network here. Like I said, I'm looking to, uh, you know, it's a growing team, basically. All right. So if you want to connect on LinkedIn or anything, you just let me know. Okay. So, Vanola, Donald, that's, I ran through quite a lot there as fast as I could. <laughs> but, uh, there we go. You did, and uh, thanks so for that. That was very interesting. I, I, I suppose I've got a question or two here, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm um, going back to your your slide where you had the digital worker experience and automation enablement, and mm -hmm. I, I guess your your journey so sounded like uh, your team started out in automation enablement and quite tools mm -hmm. focused. Th th mm -hmm. Does that imply that your team started as um, as as more like solution architects, but then as you discovered the the, the, the opportunity to productize digital workers uh, mm -hmm. that your, your team had to evolve that sort of product mindset that you talk about? Yeah, de definitely. So like when we started out, there was a couple of engineers, um, a couple of guys dedicated to support some pro project, two project managers and say the leader of the team at the time. And it actually started in operations, in the business outside of IT as a way of just getting work done that they couldn't get on the roadmap. And and what's really happened is like we had there was a lot of success with that model. We came across limitations where um, you know it's it's very hard to you know go oh, right where are the opportunities. It's opportunity discovery is the big thing, okay? Because like you can talk about automation and the amount of times I've even had conversations go, well, you couldn't automate that, right? And that's when we realized like we needed to change the focus. We're talking about the technologies, people get it, but don't get it at the same time. So let's talk about it in a way that our stakeholders are going to understand. And then we're going to be able to see where the opportunities are. And that's what caused the flip. And our team has changed. You know, we, my project managers have become product managers. I have eight of them now across the, the various areas. There's our engineers are now becoming a mix of, you know, they're using the DevOps model, for example. There's been huge changes to the way we've approached things, but I've already, I'm already seeing the benefit of it. And to to the um, to your customers, uh, you know, other parts of the organization, are they, are they still coming looking for they they've got a they, they've got a, a challenge, or do, do they have a, a notion that they're buying or that they they're going to get automation from you, or do they come, you know, talking about a problem, shall we say that that you try and work out what the solution is, and it's you know one of your digital mm -hmm. workers. Yeah. So like. With that, it really depends on the engagement. Um, we get a lot of engagement. So uh, people who are more au fait are, are, are going, right, I have a problem. What tools do you recommend or what approach do you recommend? But really with the digital worker, it's about going, oh, okay, a digital worker. Actually, can I have a digital worker that does X, Y, and Z? Do you know? So really when they're coming to us, Generally, and like generally, people have an idea in mind of what they need, you know, and that's why you're relying on that 20%, right? But what we're doing with the with the, the digital worker is we're appealing to the 80 other percent who don't have that same approach. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a question in here from uh, from James. Um, 
Very, very interesting. He says, so, so how do you think the world will be different for SaaS products in five years' time? SaaS? Yeah. Um, well, I'm always worried that they'll try and block automation because it affects their licensing costs. <laughs> because, yeah, like it does cannibalize um, uh, some of the benefits of, of the SaaS platforms. Like I know ourselves, like you know, we're big believers in cloud and uh, and everything. But uh, you know, there's a lot of SaaS applications that aren't designed in very efficient ways. And what you're going to see is, I think you're going to see a bit of a consolidation of of the industry. And uh, a lot of lessons learned are going to be are caused by automation because what's happening is businesses are automating everything that the SaaS apps can't do today. You know, so um, still think they're going to be going quite strong. I do, um, but I think the market's slightly overvalued actually on that front. My own opinion. That's my own personal opinion. Um, but I, 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 I'd see, I'd see it being a bit more consolidated, less unicorns in that front, and a bit more focus on maybe some of the. The core IT stuff that's that's there because you know data is growing hugely at the moment. It's it's not the SaaS apps uh, where 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 it's going to be. It's it's on the edge. It's on 5G and all that. So and I'm not doing a sales pitch for for Dell here, guys. That's that's, uh, that's the way. <laughs> it's, it's, it's part of the Dell uh, contract. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so so uh, Michael asks any suggestions on how to get your toes wet? Any sandbox mm -hmm. options or? Did, did I just uh, talk to you? Uh... Yeah, yeah. Like um, the best thing to do is uh, the, like any of the main vendors. Like RPA is a good one to start with because it's quite simple, right? You're you're talking user interface automation, and there's always a sandbox environment you can get access for free. Okay, so you know the likes of UiPath on automation anywhere. Example, Blue Prism, Blue Prism, for example. Not trying to sell sell their products, but you know they're they're the types of things to start looking at. Do a bit of research into that. And then kind of figure out, right, is this something that oh, we could see working in my own area, my own company? Do you know, like it's easier than traditional IT, but it's not easy. You know, you need you need um, you need uh, some infrastructure. You can do a lot of cloud based work now as well. But then your data is in the cloud with the vendor. Do you know, there's 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 risks with that. But my advice is, you know, download a license and start playing around with it. You know, it must be very different. Um field than it was as you say five years ago i mean in terms of mm -hmm. even in terms of that yeah huge yeah it's it's um uipath actually went public last week for and they were valued at 35 billion um uh, which is which is huge i mean the automation anywhere are private at the moment i can see them floating um not giving share advice either guys right yeah, yeah. but no, um, no better information there. <laughs> yeah 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 but it, it's uh like honestly it was really small when when i started looking at it so like someone came to me when i was in it and said are you interested in getting involved with this i hadn't heard of it i just saw a quicker way of having an impact that's what i saw that it. but it's really changing like it's like what you're getting I think with this is it's about enabling the the broader workforce to use technology. Like I, I see it as like the gateway drug, to be honest, in um, in doing in, in doing some automation technology because it's easy to use. You get stood up, you kind of get a taste for it, and you realize, okay, there's this is where the rewards are with this, you know. Mm. And and we're getting the general population tech savvy. It's growing hugely, but you're seeing it being pigeonholed. Like a, a vendor like UiPath, they're they're paying for partnerships with the likes of Salonas from a process mining or our Abbey Flexi Capture for optical character recognition, or you know, maybe like I don't know who they signed with, but maybe some something like IBM Watson from a machine learning point of view. Okay. But like that they're consolidating themselves around becoming the total offerings from an automation suite point of view. And um, you know, it they they really were very, very small five years ago. And now it's the fastest growing software sector, enterprise okay. software sector. Yeah. Uh -huh. And, and they were probably like, uh, they all came out of test automation, as you said. Um, yes. Uh, another question here, what kind of dev skills do you need to really test some automation and bots? Great, great question. Um, it, it really depends, right? One of the successes we had with, I'm talking about RPA a lot today, but I think that's probably the forum, right? So, but with the RPA, one of the reasons we brought it in is because we could teach a HR analyst or a finance analyst who could think logically and to develop it. You know, like it, it's not as complicated as writing something in Python, you know, but saying that if you want to be really good at automation, the more technical you are, the better, you know, you want to be using a blend of 
Python and RPA or whatever it might be, you're going to be a stronger automator, essentially. So it really is it's, it's access, accessible compared to traditional technologies. But if you want to go up to the far end of the scale, you know, you could end up being a data scientist, you know. So it really is uh, like what you're focusing on. Yeah. And, and mm-hmm. for, for, you know, for people in your team, I mean, are, 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 your, are your product managers, um, are, are they, have they got these development skills and the development background? Would that be, would that be critical um, to be a product manager in, in this? No, def- definitely not. Like I couldn't automate a single thing in RPA <laughs> in all five years. I've been doing a director. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't touched it myself, but uh, yeah, like, it, it depends. Like my re- my product manager on the real time space, uh, she's involved more with the Python development and and the API environment and all that. She's quite technical, you know. So she she's able to have those conversations with cybersecurity or with the app teams that we're trying to get access to. But then actually, one of my RPA developers, process engineer, no development background, picked it up. You know, doesn't need to be able to develop; just understands how it works. You know, so definitely it's an advantage, but definitely not a necess- necessity at all. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. Have, have you questions for Nola? Because I've got a, another one or two here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, like like what what I found really interesting was when you were speaking in particular about how you adopted, you know, you moved more into product management and the mindset shift and everything that happened around there. Because it's quite innovative, really, for an IT organization to begin to work that way. And mm-hmm. I really liked the um, how you you're engaging with your customers you know the the front that you're putting uh, to them so that you can you can get their needs much more easily from them mm. by the way that you're engaging with them now and mm. i just wonder like within the organization what kind of a response you've had to that have you noticed a difference in terms of um you know the outcomes that you're achieving and the things mm. that you're doing being more valuable and bringing more value to the mm. company than had you worked in in the traditional way around this well yeah, well de- definitely okay so look, we had a lot of success as you would have seen with the numbers anyway but it was because we we did actually approach it different to a traditional it model anyway all right i've kind of realized that we were doing some things from a product point of view it's just that was the label and now we've fully gone over there so like to, to, to give you an example, like, I mean, I was, I was based in Dublin there for the last few years and I was asked to come down and talk about what we were doing from an RPA point of view. And um, it, was, it was in IT in Cork. So I went down into the office and started talking about it and it got completely derailed because somebody, an architect was just, all he was concerned about was uh, the document repository that we were using and we were using SharePoint and it wasn't great, you know? So we spent... 40 minutes defending that I was using SharePoint. I didn't give a monkeys that were using SharePoint for document management, but it was just such a negative experience. Um, and I, I was in IT at the time and, you know, there still can be a bit of that in IT. So what we're seeing is, and not to diss my, I, I get on great with everybody in IT in Cork and everything. So anybody's on the call, but uh, the, the thing about it is, um, that, dif- that difference in approach, we've seen it right now. The leadership love it, okay? So, which is very important, right? So my own boss, uh, the chief digital officer, um, our CTO, they really believe in it because they believe in the product model themselves and we're getting buy-in from the business unit. So instead of going, oh, that's cool, you give us the technology, they now see us as a strategic partner. And like you said, like IT is traditionally seen as the servant to the business, right? But what this is an example of us partnering with the business and actually setting a way of them and their own strategies and how they're approaching their own problems. And that's where we're seeing the benefit from our side in particular. And it gives us a lot of satisfaction. Like, you know, we're not just like, all right, that's IT. Yeah, we'll give you money this year. No, go away and make sure you're delivering and there's not enough. There's no major incidents. Okay. Now it's like, hey, David, I want to talk about this technology or this approach. Uh, what you recommend, we really want to make sure we're doing what IT would like us to do and what they're going to support. And that's where we're seeing the, the real benefit in that because it's, like I said, it's a stakeholder focus. They've, they've realized that we're not just, it's not just go away, leave us alone. It's no, we're working with you. We're empowering you. We're creating a shopping experience for you. We're trying to make it easy. Like the example I use, and sorry, I'm waffling a small bit here, I'm sure, but the, the example I've been using for it is like, you know, when you go to the, when you go to um, a car garage, right? And you're like, well, I want to buy a BMW, 
Okay. Now, 5% of people are petrol heads, right? So they're like, I, you know, I want this, this, this size engine. I want it to be this special color. Um, it's got to be able to hit this marker and this metric, right? How many people do you think go into the shop and ask for all of that? Right. 5%, let's just say, okay. 95% go into BMW and go, I want a blue SUV, <laughs> you know, that's what they're asking for. Okay, so we need to do that from IT because in IT and technology, we talk about technology like it's the most complicated thing in the world. I mean, I can understand it, so it can't be that complicated, right? And that's on us to make sure that we're appealing to the, our consumers, our stakeholders, so they can get to the run to the point and going, right, I understand if I engage with this or I get this, I'm getting something for it that I can consume and understand. And that's on the technical people to do that for them, rather than saying, go away and do a master's in business information systems and come back to us, and then you can talk to us. You know, and that's that's the big, um, that's the mindset shift that we're going through as, as an organization as a whole, actually. Oh, fair, fair juice. Mm -hmm. uh, another question in here. <clears throat> do you see IT, so Dell Digital, the IT department, do you see them building solutions that are a mix of bots and the current project work to so you can merge the advantages of both approaches? Yes, I do actually. So, um, you know, the the thing is, right, at first when the digital realized how big this was getting, you know, the first thought was like, oh my God, this is a maintenance nightmare. Because it is actually, you know, you're you're creating more things to be supported. Um, but the, the conversation has gone, right, okay, instead of telling uh, everybody to, you should be engaging with the app teams, you know, that's it, you know, but the app teams going back, well, we'll get that on the roadmap for for you know a year's time it's like right let's build this and then how do we reincorporate these into the app models so you are going to have a combination of our you know digital workforce that you have here and making constant improvements to the core system because actually improving the core system is the most important thing you can do you know because that's that's taking away overhead you know you're always attacking the gaps with automation so definitely there is going to be a synergy between the two where they're they're working together and uh, they'll complement each other very, very well. And we're seeing that already. Great. Mm -hmm. Do you know, I, that was a, actually, so, so that's a very fast 45 minutes, give or take. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was actually, it was very educational and very informative. And, you know, it's, it's obvious how enthusiastic you are about the topic, actually, Dave, so uh, for juice. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what wonderful things really going on there, by the sounds of it, and uh, a very interesting product journey. So. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you very much for sharing that with us. Now, Fanola has a couple of slides to wrap up, so I will, uh, what do I need to do? Am I presenting this or no? Oh, hang on, here we go. Yeah. And over to you, Fanola. That's it. That's great. And, and thanks a million. That was fascinating. I could have asked loads more questions, <laughs> but I think um, I'll, I'll leave you be. Um, mm -hmm. the, um, just a couple of upcoming items. So tomorrow evening, Product Tank Belfast um, are running another event, um, which is on the screen there. And the event can be signed up to on Meetup. Um, it's a session on continuous discovery. And there's one of the local uh, companies there, Bizarre Voice, the Belfast branch, um, are talking through the approaches that they looked at towards uh, continuous discovery and the journey that they've been on and what they've learned over the course of that journey. So that's presented from a cross-functional team there tomorrow evening. And then for us in Product Tank Cork, uh, the next event that we have is a combined all-island um, event that we're running with product tanks from all over. Um, and that is a World Product Day event that's going to be on May 26th this year. Um, and the topics are going to be focused around AI, product management in the AI space. So it's a continuation of today's discussion in some ways as well. Um, and we will have more information that we'll be promoting about that event, more specifics on it over the next couple of weeks. Um, and I think that, oh yes, it's always great if you guys want to get in touch. Um, you know, if you have ideas that you would 
feel would be good to share um, if you want to speak or sponsor, um, if you'd like to write for the Mind the Product uh, blog, um, and if you want to become a member for more content, um, there is the link that you can join to get access to all of that information. Um, so it's always great to hear from everybody, the feedback that you might have or any questions that you have and so on. And just wrapping up on the, the product tank and mind the product, which I kind of covered at the beginning of this evening. So that's that's all the information that I had on the upcoming events. OK, lovely. OK, well, then uh, without further ado, thank you very much, uh, Dave. Really, that was awesome. We'll uh, talk soon. And thanks for Pleasure. joining everybody. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it'll be on YouTube for posterity. OK, mm -hmm. bye bye, everybody. Take care. Thanks, thank you. Bye.